I'm Katie Usalis, Partnerships Director at Represent Women. To those of you who joined yesterday, welcome back. To those joining for the first time today, a very warm welcome to Represent Women's second annual Democracy Solutions Summit. As you may know, today is International Women's Day. And what's so special about this summit, um, beyond the uh, incredible depth and range of expertise of our speakers today, is that it's an opportunity to celebrate all the diverse women who are really leading the charge in democracy reform. So before I begin, I would just like to say happy International Women's Day to all of our speakers and all of our attendees joining us. Um, the second day of the Democracy Solution Summit is focused on fair elections, and specifically we'll talk a little bit more about the U.S. presidential elections. And we're going to hear about viable, scalable, and transformative solutions such as ranked choice voting in presidential primaries, um, the national popular votes, and also various innovations in public finance that improve our election processes. And we will end the day just like yesterday with a take action panel so that you can know exactly how to be a part of the solution. This event is being recorded and we will be posting it to our website in a, in a couple of days. And closed captioning is available down in your Zoom dashboard if you would like to turn that on. Um, with that, I would now like to welcome our keynote speakers, Aaron Velarde, the CEO and founder of Vote Run Lead. We also have Rena Shaw, She's a political consultant, um, the CEO of Relax Strategies, and one of our beloved board members. And we also will be joined by New York Attorney General Letitia James. Um, we will start off with Erin Velarde. Go ahead, Erin. Hi, everyone. It is so wonderful to be here. Congratulations to represent women on the second annual summit. Last year was a huge success. I know yesterday was fantastic. And I'm thrilled to be with you for International Women's Day to be talking about democracy. My name is Erin Velarde. I'm the founder and CEO of Vote Run Lead, and we train women to run for office and win. Our goal is nothing short of women's majorities, at least 51% at every level of government. And we're focusing like a laser on the state legislatures to make sure that our legislatures are majority female, majority women, an expansive view of women, and reflective of the democracies, um, reflective of the communities in that state. So I'm so glad to be here with my friend Cynthia, um, who is doing amazing work. Today we're talking. We're going to. You're going to be hearing from speakers on um, everything from RCV, um, how it affects the presidential elections, public campaign finance, public funds for childcare with some of the most remarkable women on the ground, um, including my friend Luba Gretchen Shirley from Vote Mama, who you'll hear from shortly, Anne Ravel, who is um, just a bevy of knowledge around public finance, Jenna Griswold, Colorado Secretary of State, one of my favorite secretaries of state. Um, all of my Secretary of State faves are women, which um, actually tells us something. On this International Women's Day, I do want to point out that we as um, leaders, as advocates for democracy here in the states, have a responsibility. The world often looks to us um, more often probably than they should about what we can do next, where America is going, and the stability that our democracy provides globally. We also have a responsibility to learn from others who are doing things better than we are doing them. And I know some of our speakers this afternoon are gonna give you some fantastic examples about how that is happening uh, around the country. Um, I'm a huge proponent of ranked choice voting. I'm a huge proponent of ranked choice voting because I've seen it firsthand here in New York City and the beautiful research that uh, 21 for 21 and um, represent women did together. I participated in that election. I helped women run for that election. Uh, we vote run lead provided trainings 
um, on how to run in an RCV election and here in the city and all across the country. And I know that it works because I've seen it. I know that it works because the research is there. I know that it works because the results show that more women and people of color get elected. And we know the cities and mayoral races where women run in RCV have close to 50% women's representation. Um, but when it comes to our presidential primaries, one of the most exciting things I think will happen when we use RCV, the presidential le level, is you will end up being able to truly cast a slate, right? The beautiful thing about RCV is that you do not have to walk into the ballot box and choose one. And what that allows you to do when looking at the president of the United States, it gives us the broadest electoral appeal, the broadest electoral appeal. When I have to talk about RCV ranked choice voting around the country and I have to explain it to folks that are sort of skeptical or don't know what it's about, that I often say to them, the most people are most happy with the result of an RCV election. And right now with the extremism that happens, um, we need most of us to be mostly happy. Um, and so I'm, I'm looking forward to the opening panel around RCV and presidential primaries and I'm excited for you to hear about that. My work at Vote Run Lead to train women to run for office is about action. So I wanna make sure I leave you with real actions. One, our presidential primaries, they happen at a state by state level. So make sure that you are, when you're hearing these fantastic tidbits and knowledge and research reports and actions that are coming out of today, that you're thinking about who has influence in your state, right? Party influence in your state, party leaders, state legislators. Are you being, are you contacting the right folks with the information you're learning today? Are you using your influence as a citizen, as a voter, as a, a head of a community organization, as an expert? Are you um, giving testimony at the state capitol? Are you having conversations with influencers at the state level uh, around where we can see these changes being made around presidential politics? Um, make sure that you're giving to some of these amazing secretaries of state that you're seeing. We saw firsthand how important secretaries of state have been in presidential elections in the last year and continue to learn and read and some of these amazing international examples that are going to be given. Um, I'm just, all of the solutions today are actually that. They are real solutions. None of these things, though, separately are sort of the silver bullet for our democracy. Our democracy is too complicated. This sort of federated republic, the system that we have at the 50 state level with each party running their own primaries, like this is complex. But each of the solutions from ranked choice voting to public finance um, for child care to get more women in to over rehaul of the campaign finance system, all of these solutions together will strengthen that democracy. It will make it safer for all of us to participate and vote, and it will increase the diversity of leaders. And it will set that international model um, that we know we need to continue um, to rise to the challenge to do just that. So thank you to represent women. Um, I'm so excited to turn it over to um, Rena Shah, who's not only an advisor to uh, Cynthia and her team, but to Vote Run Lead and to our efforts. Um, and encourage you to get out there to vote, to run, to lead, and to make sure that the you are supporting the dynamic women and women of color who do decide to run for office by advocating for the critical systems change that you're going to hear about today and that we need to truly make this a reflective democracy. So thank you for having me. And I'm so happy to see you, Rena, and to hear what you have to say. Hey, Erin, thanks for that. And it's a pleasure to be part of the Represent Women family as well as the Vote Run Lead family. Today, I wanna to wish you all out there listening a very happy International Women's Day. Uh, it is a special month over here in the United States with Women's History Month. And it's just a pleasure to be talking about the issues that matter to me and I know all of you, as well as, well as just real world practical solutions for our democracy. I'm the daughter of immigrants and I love being an American. I really talk about that in every sphere, but today, I wanted to talk about my experience because I've had the great pleasure of serving as a chief spokeswoman for two U.S. presidential campaigns. Aside from that, and along with that, actually, I should add, I've been an advisor to a total of four U.S. presidential campaigns. Now, those have run the gamut from Republican, Independent, to Libertarian. I've seen how the sausage is made, for lack of a better word, uh, or phrase, rather. And I'll say this, it's not been exactly pretty. It's a bit of a broken system when I talk about our presidential primary nominating process and what I've seen. But the good news is, is that it's fixable. 
I'm not just seeing how it's all done. I'm not just learned a thing or two, but I've really gone in the belly of the beast and figured out as I've gone from South Carolina to Iowa, all the way out to California and Washington state and spent a lot of time in places like Utah and Texas, what we can do to make this nomination process better across the spectrum and with both major parties. Now, people I know this year care about a third party option. And that's something that we as Americans should continue to seek out. Anybody who says it's not possible doesn't know about US politics. Anything is possible here. And when we women come to the table, really, we can make the changes we need to see to make the presidential nominating process so much better than it already is. We know that women care about common sense solutions. We know that women are up to the task. How come we're so underrepresented when it comes to the US presidential nominating process? Last month, uh, former governor of South Carolina, Nikki Haley, became the first woman governor, either former or current, to seek out a presidential nomination. That means she's the first one, a governor, to enter the primary process. I would have thought that would have happened far sooner than the year 2023. Look, I know a lot of you are frustrated. The stats aren't great. There aren't that many uh, examples to look to here in the Western Hemisphere. Heck, we haven't even had a head of state here. And I know that is a great source of frustration for a lot of you, but let's turn that into motivation. We can talk about how we make this cookie crumble differently. 2024 is around the corner, but in a way it's still a long ways away. We need systemic reform. And as I've traveled the country as a political consultant and operative, I know that there's an appetite for things like ending gerrymandering, getting big money out of politics, and for one of my favorite reforms, ranked choice voting. So when we talk about an equitable future and about electing a woman as American president, we can get there, but it's gonna take you going to the polls and you sharing nuggets of wisdom that you'll learn today and tomorrow and that you learned yesterday through this Democracy Solutions Summit. Take those, share those with friends, particularly women who say, hey, politics isn't for me. It's a man's sport. What happens in Washington impacts all of our lives. And we shouldn't just care when it's a presidential election year. We should care every day of the year. So take these nuggets, take your friends to the polls, share with them what you've learned, and especially keep in touch with the voices. People like me, find me on social media, approach me with questions, approach us with the ideas that you have and what you think needs to change because we can do this as a collective. We can make a more free, fair, and just America that elects a woman as president in our lifetime. Very soon, I must add, I think it's coming. I do think we can do it together, but we can't do it unless we lift our voices together. So I'm so happy to be here with you today, and I look forward to seeing you at the polls in 2024. Thank you so much, Erin and Rena. Erin, I really, really loved what you were saying about making sure that we're having a holistic approach. You're absolutely right. It's not a one size fits all thing. And it really takes multiple components to really reach gender balance and, and have better elections in our lifetime. And Rena, your, uh, your hope and your motivation and your fire for this work is so contagious. Thank you so, so much. Um, so last but certainly not least, New York Attorney General Tish James, she's not able to join us live today, but she has recorded her remarks um, and she'll join us via video. So let's go take a look at that. Hello, this is New York State Attorney General Letitia James. Thank you for inviting me to be a part of this important summit. I want to especially recognize your founder and great executive director, Cynthia Ritchie Terrell. And of course, all of the remarkable members of Represent Women for all you have done and continue to do for our country. Given all that has happened recently, this summit is more than a timely event. This is a necessary gathering of impassioned and empowered women to strategize, energize, and motivate women to go out and fight to secure our fragile democracy. This year hasn't been easy for us we faced a terrible setback at the United States Supreme Court to our long cherished right to control our bodies. We face a near daily assault on our individual and family safety with the devastating epidemic of gun violence with no end in sight. And every bit as urgent, we are confronting an effort to roll back the basic voting rights of marginalized communities. These anti-democratic actions disproportionately harm women especially women of color. So I want to express my profound gratitude to represent women's leadership and your steadfast commitment to building a 
21st century democracy. I am particularly grateful for your emphasis on inclusive gender balance at every level of government in the United States. Your support for public financing of campaigns and focus on promoting women of color to elected office is what will change our representation in government. In fact, it's exactly why I am where I am today. We all know that running for office isn't easy. The work is demanding, the schedule relentless, but there is nothing more rewarding. But for those of us who are called to serve, there can often be an incredible barrier standing in our way, money. Anyone who does not have deep pockets or connections to those who do is at an automatic and often huge disadvantage. Unfortunately, this includes most ordinary, hardworking citizens in this city and state, especially if you are a person of color or a woman. For those of you who don't know, public financing is how I was able to run for office. I come from humble means and never had access to deep pocketed donors or a network of ultra wealthy people. But thanks to public financing, I was able to run for office, to be a viable candidate and to earn my constituents respect and support. Public financing meant that my neighbors, some with limited means were able to be a part of the democratic process. When I first ran for office, I did not know any millionaires, but I knew those who wanted to have a voice in government and have a seat at the table. The public financing system in New York City allowed me to compete and succeed. It allowed me to represent individuals whose voices have been historically ignored. The $5 I received from my neighbor who lives in public housing should be just as important and valuable as anyone else's money. And that is hugely significant and truly helps support our democracy by giving real people real power to choose who represents them, not outside groups who don't really know a community. It empowered these New Yorkers to support a candidate who looked like them, understood their values and recognized their struggles. And that should be the centerpiece of our democracy. But this incredible barrier is what prevents it from happening. Just as everyone in this country should have access, equal access to voting, so should everyone have equal access to running for office. In a strong and vibrant democracy, government must be reflective of the people it represents. And public financing is a critical tool to ensure that more people from diverse backgrounds have the opportunity to hold elected office and serve our communities. It is a great equalizer that has helped countless people of color be lifted up by their constituents and empowered to run in New York City and municipalities across the country. Simply put, public financing is essential for allowing more diverse candidates to run for office and to represent us. Our democracy is only alive and well if it genuinely empowers those with the drive, ideas, and desire to serve the public to be viable candidates for high office. As Americans, we face a stark choice. We can resign ourselves to having elected office be within reach for only the super wealthy or those able to secure mega donations, or we can say that our democracy should be available to all and that elections should be truly reflective of the people, all people. Thank you, representing women, for making this case so clear. But most importantly, thank you for offering innovative ways to strengthen our representative democracy. The challenges ahead of us may be great, but thankfully the work you are doing will prepare us to face them head on and to win. So please run women. Women should run and women can win. But we need, all need to support public financing. Thank you so much and have a great day. Thank you so, so much to these three esteemed women uh, for your valuable insights and perspective on the need for improving our presidential elections. Um, we will now take a quick break as we transition into the first expert discussion session on ranked choice voting in presidential primaries and the national popular vote, where we will hear from the Honorable Amber McReynolds, Colorado Secretary of State Jenna Griswold, and the Executive Director of the Democratic Party in Hawaii, Aaron Fernandez. And if you are into pub quizzes, we do have some trivia questions for you during the break. And you can just head over to Twitter at Represent Women to submit your answers via the poll there. Um, and just a heads up, you can also join in on today's conversations and share your own opinions and your own thoughts on Twitter with the hashtag 2023 DSS. Um, and we'll see you back here in one minute.
Welcome back, everyone, and a very warm welcome to election experts Amber McReynolds, Secretary Jenna Griswold, and Aaron Fernandez. Um, the Honorable Amber McReynolds is a leading elections expert in election administration and policy, and she serves on the National Council on Election Integrity, the National Task Force on Election Crises, and she serves as a senior advisor for several nonprofit organizations working to improve democracy. As an election official in Denver, Colorado, she led efforts to transform Colorado's voting model and implement first ever in the world innovative technology. She was also the founding CEO of the National Vote at Home Institute. Amber was appointed to the Postal Service Board of Governors by President Biden and was confirmed by the Senate in 2021. And last but certainly not least, she is the co-author of When Women Vote, which highlights the challenges that Americans, especially women, face when trying to access the current voting system. And of course, the amazing things that happen with reform. So happy to have you here with us, Amber. Um, I'd also like to introduce Secretary Jenna Griswold. She is Colorado's 39th Secretary of State. She was first elected in 2018 as the youngest elected Secretary of State in the country, and she was re-elected to office in 2022, last year. Um, Jenna Griswold grew up in a working class family in rural Colorado, and so she knows firsthand how important it is for every vote to count, no matter your background. Um, she's an advocate for the national popular vote, and she is very proud that Colorado is a member of the National Popular Vote Interstate Compact. Welcome, Secretary Griswold. And last but not least, Erin Fernandez has been the executive director of the Democratic Party of Hawaii since June of 2019. Um, she co helped complete the first all mail-in ballot party-run presidential primary the first state e-convention in 2020, and was part of the team that brought about the first hybrid state convention last year in 2022. Velina Aaron, and good morning to you. With that, I pass the mic over to Amber. Great, thanks so much, Katie, and thanks to Represent Women for coordinating this incredible panel, and thank you, Secretary Griswold and Aaron, uh, for being a part of this important conversation today on International Women's Day, no less. So um, it's great to have you both here. Um, as, as this panel uh, and the title suggests, uh, we're, we wanna talk about how we can better improve uh, the presidential election process for all voters and ensure fair representation, ensure the system works well for everyone. Um, and I was just looking at some data the other day, uh, still uh, even in 2023, most of the states and, and the primary processes are still closed to voters that are not Democrats, are not Republicans. Obviously, this varies around the country and uh, and continues to vary. But there are a significant number of voters now that have chosen neither party and are unaffiliated, and they're left out. And that's that ends up being about 45% of the country that has limitations on their ability to participate. So this is clearly an important conversation to continue to make sure that our elections are, are representative of all voices and ensure all votes are counted. Um, so for both, for Secretary Griswold, um, I thought I'd pose a question to you to, to kick us off here. And obviously you've worked on national popular vote reforms for many years, but um, maybe to give the audience a little bit of flavor uh, for presidential elections, how do states and parties currently decide who will win electors for presidential elections and what are the issues with the system currently uh, that exists, which clearly relates to some of the work that you've been doing on national popular vote? Well, hello, everybody. Uh, so glad to join you. I'm Jenna Griswold, Colorado Secretary of State, and Amber, thank you for the question. Um, so how electors are appointed uh, actually was a bit up for dispute prior to a lawsuit um, that my office actually defended uh, in the lead up to the, the 2020 election, presidential election. Um, so now how electors are appointed is determined by what state law is. In Colorado and in the majority of states, um, the, the law is the electors go to whoever wins the popular vote in the state. Now, that concept that electoral votes are, are given on the basis of state law what was something that people disagreed on. Uh, and so uh, my predecessor was sued um, in, uh, in the 2018 election or excuse me, 2016, and then we went to the Supreme Court and the Supreme Court decided if there was is a state law, electors are, are given based on that state law. 
Um, but ultimately, I, I think uh, Americans uh, believe in fairness and what's fair is one person, one vote. And the electoral system itself is a little skewed. Can you imagine uh, that on a per person basis that a voter in Wyoming has more of a voice than a voter in Texas or in New York or California? Uh, growing up in a small town, you know, I, I grew up in a cabin with an outhouse outside on food stamps. I know that fundamentally that the voice of, of rural people, the voice of, of people in the big cities, regardless of the color of your skin, the amount of money in, in your bank account, it should be every voice is equal. And that's what the National Popular Vote Compact will do. It will make sure that everybody's voice is equal in a presidential election. Great, thanks so much. And, and you highlighted the delicate selection process. And so before Aaron, I um, throw a question over to you. Uh, one of the things in that process, so back in uh, 2020, uh, actually in the Democratic presidential primary race, um, about 5 million voters nationwide cast uh, uh, ballots for presidential candidates that fell below the delicate threshold. So meaning their, their vote was cast for someone that fell below that threshold, so it wasn't part of the final tally. And an additional 3 million, as part of that, about 3 million voters actually um, cast ballots for presidential candidates that ultimately dropped out by the time the election came around. Now, Aaron, in Hawaii, and um, and I, it was, I didn't get to talk, work with you a lot in 2020 on this because I was actually helping Alaska, Wyoming, Kansas run their presidential primaries, but you all did something unique and innovative uh, in Hawaii, as well as Alaska, Wyoming, and Kansas all did as well, in that you ran uh, your presidential primary using not only ranked choice voting, but also universal vote by mail. Uh, ballots went out to all eligible Democrats that were able to participate in that election. So I'd love to hear your perspective on that, how the solution that you all have in Hawaii solves this problem of votes being not counted and voices not being heard in the presidential primary process. Well, thank you, Amber. I'm excited to be here with both you and Secretary Griswold. Uh, it was such a great um, experience and idea that they um, had, that we'd worked on throughout time. And um, I don't think we realized when those decisions were being made, how much of an impact it would have in that 2020 election. Um, but just the ability to have so many more people, so many more of our members' voices heard through that process really made a huge difference. Um, on Super Tuesday, we had had some, you know, shortly after that, a number of candidates had dropped out. Uh, and by the time we would have originally uh, tallied our votes, uh, there weren't very many candidates left. Uh, due to the pandemic, we tallied our votes about a month and a half later uh, because we had to initiate a third round of ballot since in-person voting wouldn't have been available. Uh, and so those sites, because we didn't have them, we had to create a new deadline, uh, you know, proceed with a third round of mail ballots and extend the time period for people so that participation could be uh, uh, widened in that respect. Uh, by that time, there really was only one candidate left. Uh, <laughs> and so we did, you know, I feel that in that process, the tremendous amount of people who, you know, the last two candidates, uh, who had chosen the last two candidates as one of the three candidates they had ranked uh, was a super majority. And so they really felt like their voices were heard and they will participate again in the future because uh, they felt included and uh, validated in that election. Great, thanks so much, Erin, for that. Um, and Secretary Griswold, I wanna turn back to you um, as well. Give us, give the audience a little bit of perspective about what would change? So the, the compact and the National Popular Vote Compact that you've been working on, you know, if there is a transition to 
considering or or uh, or changing the way the electoral college works, not only in the in the race but also through the compact. Like, what what does that look like in the future practically for voters, and what does the public actually see uh, on the back end in terms of that process as compared to what we have now, which is very limited visibility in terms of the electoral college process. So if the compact is passed in enough states, um, what the National Popular Vote Compact would do uh, would require states, uh, if enough states opted into the law, to cast their electoral votes for whoever wins the majority presidential election across the country. Uh, so that would mean that the vote, uh, that the candidate who gets the most votes wins. That's how Americans actually think our elections work. Uh, but when it comes to the presidential election, that's not always true. You can win the presidency without winning the majority of votes. Living in a democracy should mean one person, one vote. And it's everyone's vote uh, across the country, not some states having more power than other states. So we have to change the system to get to that ideal. That's what the National Popular Vote Compact allows the country to do. Uh, and ultimately, if a candidate wants to win votes, they should do so through policies and messages that persuade and speak to the needs of all Americans, from blue and red states to working families to first time voters who are all concerned about our future. But what we see now with the Electoral College is that some states just have more importance and more power to winning the presidency. And so candidates sometimes, oftentimes, decide to focus on very small groups of the vote of electors to be able to win the presidency because it's not majority wins, it's Electoral College majority wins. Uh, so it's one thing of uh, putting the way to put power back in the hands of everyday people. But the National Vote Compact it isn't enough by itself. We know that right now in the United States, uh, we are seeing a continued coordinated effort to undermine the will of the people, to suppress the vote, to gerrymander, to allow endless amount of dark money to come in to drown uh, regular people's voices from the political process. So it's past time that, that we really look at uh, inclusive democracy reform. That means passing the national popular vote impact, uh, uh, interstate compact, excuse me, across the nation. That means the Freedom to Vote Act, making sure that every eligible voter, regardless of their zip code, color of their skin, or the amount of money in their bank account, can have their voice heard in accessible and secure elections. That means Congress passing the John Lewis Voting Rights Act, stopping gerrymandering, and taking on corruption through campaign finance reform. So it's definitely one major piece of the puzzle, but I am so optimistic that in the coming years, with democracy continuing to be front and center on many Americans' minds, that we are going to build a stronger foundation for this country for decades and centuries to come. Thank you for that. And, and also just for the audience, make sure that you're looking at the chat because while Secretary Griswold was talking, uh, Cynthia Ritchie actually shared uh, how popular the national popular vote um, changes are amongst the electorate that came from the League of Women Voters. So there's a ton of information in there. Also, Cynthia shared some of the stats that I mentioned about uh, votes being lost because of uh, the plurality uh, process instead of using ranked choice voting as what uh, Aaron used in Hawaii. Um, Aaron, I have a question for you, um, which I know in the three states that I was involved in in 2020, turnout went up significantly uh, amongst those uh, elections that they were using the mail ballot and then also having ranked choice voting. What kind of impacts like that did you see in Hawaii when you combined ranked choice voting with the mail ballot usage? Uh, we had about the same turnout as 2016, uh, but it, it significantly higher than previous years. So we did see an influx in 2016 to about, um, you know, 50, almost 50 percent uh, voting of our membership. Uh, and so that was tremendous. In past years, I mean, in some of the caucus uh, events, there had only been about 3,000, 6,000 people voting. And so that when you're voting for such an important position as the president of the United States, uh, like Secretary Griswold said, the more voices, the more people that we hear from, um, the more solid that choice is. And so participation is tremendously important. We'd like to have even more participation. Right. And, and we sure don't want to see, gosh, people make the effort to go participate and turn their ballot in and trust that it's going to be counted. And, and you know, when we have these systems 
with all these candidates that are dropping out and it and voters are like paying attention to this daily, if their votes aren't counted when they've made this effort, that diminishes trust long term. So it seems like the model that you guys have created and the other states started to use in 2020 or did use in 2020 and are expanding now, there's a lot of legislation happening around ranked choice voting and presidential primaries. And it's really because it's the only way to solve this problem of candidates dropping out or the delicate threshold, not you know meeting the criteria for the vote to be counted. Like it's really the only way for fairness and for votes to really be counted, which is, which is so critical, uh, especially to build trust back into our elections as Secretary Griswold mentioned uh, as well in terms of it being under attack. Um, I, I just put this question out to both of you and Secretary Griswold, we can start with you. Um, but, you know, national popular vote, you already mentioned a few things, but how, how can states or what else can states do um, to ensure that trust continues to improve and that democracy is preserved and that voters have confidence in the process? And certainly what, you, what you've worked on with national popular vote, but you know, is ranked choice voting another solution for certain types of elections? Or what other things do you see uh, just generally on how to improve trust in the election process? Well, I, I think uh, first and foremost, uh, election administration is tricky. Uh, so you may have a really good idea that works in a caucus or works in, in different settings, um, but there's various uh, things that you have to be thinking about with new initiatives. So for example, security. Uh, Colorado is considered the securest state in the nation in which to cast a ballot. So one of the things that we're always thinking about is uh, are our new initiatives going to maintain our, our gold standard of security? Uh, we have to be thinking about access. As Secretary of State, I've increased drop boxes by over 60%. We added more in-person voting centers. Uh, we made sure there was increased transparency through statewide uh, vote by mail ballot tracking. And we also partnered um, with populations like Coloradans living on tribal lands to make sure that historic voter suppression was reversed and that we were proactively engaging groups uh, that have all the rights under the US Constitution to cast a ballot, but have a, a, a history of being historically suppressed. Uh, and reforms like that, making sure that Coloradans have the access they deserve under the U.S. Constitution and under state, the state constitution as U.S. citizens, making sure that we were adding transparency, making sure that we were adding security, uh, has led to record results in the state of Colorado and our continued success. Uh, so we have to make sure that as we move forward that we have several goals in mind. Number one, opening up access. Across this nation, there are voters in many states, way too many states, that do not have sufficient access to the ballot box. And elected officials who would like to suppress the right to vote for their own political gain uh, are acting in an undemocratic, un-American way, and we should do everything that we can to make sure that every voice is heard. We have to continue uh, to increase our uh, election security. That includes uh, risk limiting audits, which are the best audits in the nation that Colorado does and making sure that when we innovate, uh, those audits are also innovated. Uh, Coloradans and voters all should be voting uh, predominantly on a piece of paper that are not hackable from our foreign adversaries. We have to continue to add transparency and always innovate because even being secretary of state and the best uh, state in the nation to ca cast a ballot, there is more that we can do and more that we put into law and into election rule every single year to make sure that we continue to be the best. And, and what that means is that it's easy and secure for eligible people to cast a ballot and make their voices heard. Thank you for that. Um, and Aaron, you know, I guess in addition to the ranked choice, so one of the other stats about presidential primaries that a lot of folks don't uh, often know or, or hear about just because it happens once every four years is most states also still close their primaries to anyone who's not affiliated with either the Republican or Democratic uh, party. So I'm curious, you know what, in addition to the ranked choice voting and in addition to vote by mail, you know, do you have any thoughts about that and maybe share what Hawaii does? Because um, there's a number of states that, again, this is completely closed. They're semi-closed. Colorado has kind of a semi-open process. And then there's states that are fully open. But a large chunk of voters are now in that category of being independent, and that 45%, and they're completely closed out. So I'd be curious as to your you know, thoughts on that and, and what you see in your state. Well, so in Hawaii, nobody registers by party affiliation. And so um, 
that's the first thing. Uh, so it's incumbent upon us as the party to go and reach out for members. So, you know, a great media strategy to get the information out to the general population who aren't, you know, the uh, political wonks who are within my party structure. And so outreach is incredibly important when it comes to uh, this. And, you know, our party has done a tremendous amount of outreach through media and all types of ways to be able to include as many people as possible. We also, uh, and I know a lot of states do this, uh, our national party works very hard to assure that we have same day registration processes in place. And so in Hawaii, you can come to our in-day voting, um, in-person voting, and do same day registration and enrollment in the party. Yeah. And being so, a former and being a former caucus state, um, because I, I was actually talking with someone the other day about this, ranked choice voting is kind of like uh caucus but private. So instead of raising your hand and being public, you're making your choices and you're prioritizing those in a private way instead of the more public way that Iowa or like what you used to do in Hawaii. Is that a fair assessment of that? It's very similar um, to that process. And so your second choice and your third choice would be similar to caucuses where, you know, the threshold isn't viable and the people reassemble and move throughout um, the facility into their new um, candidates area. Uh, yeah. yeah, so that is, it's very similar. I think the difference here is some of the things that we're talking about um, uh, yesterday and as well as earlier today, and it really helps to, not everybody can get to a caucus at a certain time and a certain place. You know, there's a lot of people who work multiple jobs. There's a lot of people who are disabled and are not able to um, physically go there and participate due to either disability or illness. And so having a male system lets them in, be involved, incorporates them into this process. And that's how that outreach and that participation um, helps us to have more people feel um, included and heard in this process. Well, thanks so much for that. And I know Secretary Griswold, you have to head to something else. I didn't know if you wanted to share a few comments before hopping off and then Aaron and I'll close out as well. I just want to make sure we were considerate of your of your other commitment. Well, I just want to say thank you. Thank you to everybody for participating. Um, this is a wonderful panel. Uh, and I, I think it's so timely because ultimately women across the nation have been standing up to protect democracy at a time when democracy has been in peril. Uh, and as the Attorney General mentioned, it's so important to support women running for office. I ran for Secretary of State at the age of 32. I'd never ran for anything in my life, not even student council. Uh, and it was a, a race that many thought was an impossible race. And it's just been an honor of my lifetime to protect our democracy here in Colorado and across the nation. I am so optimistic for the future of this country, but we continue to be in tough times that we will get through in the future, in the coming years. Uh, so just stay positive, keep on doing the work that you all are doing across the country. Thank you so much, Amber. Thank you, Aaron, and, and thank you, everybody. I hope to connect with you all soon. Bye-bye. Thank you. Um, well, I and Aaron, I, I wanted to just give you, if you want to close out with a few comments, and then I'll close things out and turn it back over to Katie. I just wanted to say thank you so much for having having me here. Um, and Amber, I did have a question for you, actually. Okay. Um, how do you feel um, that your uh, position helps in the furtherance of the work that the women here are doing? Sure. Well, I'm a former election official in Denver, and I helped, you know, rewrite our Colorado election laws and uh, modernize them now 10 years ago, if you can believe it, it was 10 years ago that we put the model in place. Um, and it's been, continued to improve and evolve over time, but Colorado is one of the top states for turnout. I think the combination with ranked choice voting is, I think ranked choice voting provides such an unnecessary reform uh, to, to ensure fairness. And I think there are certain election models where it's absolutely critical for including the presidential primary process. Like it is unacceptable to me that 
5 million Democratic voters lost their votes basically in 2020 and about two and a half million in 2016 Republican voters that participated in that very large field of an election in 2016. And so I certainly don't want to see those things continue um, in this process and then open primaries and what I was mentioning about this huge growth in unaffiliated voters like we can't sort of just ignore the fact that there are changing dynamics in the electorate and we have to make sure that our systems fully provide access and fairness to those folks to have a voice and have a vote count. Um, so I think both of those things are important. And then uh, for me, I, I do serve on the board of governors for the Postal Service. And so uh, we are the only entity in the country that, pr that provides service to every election office, every voter, and every local uh, community in the entire country. And so uh, the work that, that we do in delivering the nation's election mail, whether that's a ballot or a voter information notice or a polling place reminder, whatever that piece of mail is, uh, the Postal Service is absolutely critical in delivering democracy for America. Uh, and it's, it's an important role and I'm honored to serve on that role and, and chair the elections committee. So thank well, you for that question. Thank you for all of your work. Yeah, Thanks. thanks so much. Thanks so much. Um, Katie, Katie, I'll turn it back over to you. Uh, hopefully we we made our, our time correctly. And thanks again for having this panel and inviting us all to be here. Thank you so much for joining. It really, really is such an enriching conversation. And it truly is such a joy to be, you know, a little fly on the wall listening to you all talk shop about you know, the ways we can um, improve our democracy. So thank you so much for joining us. We are a little bit behind schedule, so we're going to move right into our next expert discussion on campaign finance with experts Anne Ravel, Ellen Weintraub, and DC Council member Christina Henderson. Um, Anne Ravel was nominated to the Federal Election Commission by President Obama in June um, 2013. And she officially joined the commission after receiving the unanimous support of the United States Senate in October of 2013. She served as vice chair of the commission in 2014 and chair in 2015. Welcome, Anne. So good to see you. Thank um, you. Ellen good Weintraub. You. I'm going to, can I introduce Ellen? Is that good or do you want to go ahead? Go for it. No, go ahead. You okay. Can, okay. Please, okay. please introduce my okay. former colleague. Okay. Get a little info. Great. Um, yes, yeah, so Ellen Weintraub is joining us today, too. She currently serves on the Federal Election Commission and has served since 2002. She has chaired the FEC three times, and during her tenure, Commissioner Weintraub has served as a consistent voice for meaningful campaign management <laughs> and robust disclosure. She believes that strong and fair regulation of money in politics is important to prevent corruption and to maintain the faith of the American people in their democracy. Good afternoon, Ellen. Thank you for joining. And we also have Christina Henderson. She is an at-large member of the Council of the District of Columbia, which offers a voluntary public financing program for local political campaigns right there in <clears throat> Um, as a trusted political advisor, Christina has counseled United States senators, D.C. council members, and state and local education officials on an array of domestic policy issues. And prior to serving as a member of the D.C. council, uh, Christina served as a legislative assistant for U.S. Senator Minority Leader Charles Schumer, where she handled education, workforce, and postal and census issues for both the leadership and the personal office. Uh, we are happy to have you with us, Council Member Hudson. Okay, and the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Katie. And um, I'm really pleased to be able to speak on this panel because campaign finance is a really significant problem and issue that we have in this country. And as others have already mentioned in some of the previous panels, this is one of the major uh, undemocratic undem issues <laughs> that we have in our electoral process. And frankly, um, I think most of the American public feel the same way. And I've actually um, read statistics that indicate that uh, both Republicans and Democrats, left and right, are concerned about our campaign finance problems in this country. So it's really great to see you, Ellen and Christina, to talk about innovations in campaign finance, which we sorely need uh, in this country. And I do want to start off by saying, because um, I, I'm so concerned about the 
the issue, even though I am no longer um, either on the Federal Election Commission or the State Commission that I was on, uh, because just thinking about this, um, in the midterm election in 2022, um, there was $8.9 billion, and that's with a B, uh, spent um, in federal elections and with by federal candidates, the party committees, the PACs, and outside groups. And not only that, but we have to remember that this is a problem on the state level as well. And in uh, the states, there was seven point, where did I have this written down? $7.1 billion spent in state governments uh, for state candidates, party committees, and ballot measure committees. And this amount of money has had such a huge impact on the ability of women to run for office and to get elected uh, and minorities to do the same. And as a result of that, uh, we also have, as I mentioned before, people who think that money has influence over all the, and they're right, on the elected officials. Um, and that they themselves do not have a voice in government because of that. So I'm really happy to see both of you. And I know um, you've both been working, both you, Christina and, and Ellen, um, on issues um, about uh, sort of how to, how to ameliorate some of these problems that will make the electoral process more fair. So I'll start with you, Ellen. Um, can you tell me that one, what do you think are some of the biggest issues in campaign finance, um, which of course I could go on for hours on that as you probably could too, um, but also um, where do you think things stand in this um, issue with regard to public financing? Well, uh, first of all, thank you to the organizers for inviting me. And it's always a pleasure to, to see you. And uh, you and I have indeed all talked for hours on this very topic. <laughs> Uh, you talked about the uh, $8.9 billion that was spent on the uh, midterm. What is uh, perhaps even more striking is that in the last presidential race in 2020, the number was $14.4 billion. And that was more than double what was spent in 2016. There was not a big increase between 2012 and 2016 at the, uh, uh, in the presidential election years, but from 2016 to 2020, it almost doubled. Uh, no, it more than doubled. And, and that is just, you know, an extraordinary amount of money. Now, um, if you look just at the two presidential candidates, Joe Biden raised $937.7 million, almost a billion dollars, setting all records for uh, presidential fundraising. And Donald Trump raised Five hundred and almost five hundred ninety-six million dollars. Uh, so it's if you want to run for president, you got to raise a whole lot of money. Now, an interesting wrinkle on this is that each of them raised about sixty percent of that take uh, from donors who were what we call small donors who gave less than two hundred dollars, and uh, mm -hmm. that is a lot of engagement from a lot of people across the country who are giving in small amounts, and and that is you know, a little bit of encouragement. We're seeing uh, an increase in the percentage of money that's being contributed by, uh, by small donors. So that is, that is a small ray of sunshine. Um, but, you know, again, that's, it's still, <laughs> that is a whole lot of money to have to raise. Um, and the current public financing system really can't keep up with that. For one thing, there are caps on how much money, if you take the public financing, there's caps on how much you can spend. And those, uh, the cap for the general in 2020 would have been um, almost $104 million, which since I just told you how much each president, each of the major presidential candidates raised, that wouldn't get you very far. That's, um, that's a fraction of what the candidates actually ended up 
racing, which is why participating in the public funding system right now is not really a viable option uh, for somebody who really wants to be successful. And I think everybody knows this. No major party candidate has participated in the public funding system since 2008. Uh, and um, it's, it's the rules are just obsolete. Uh, I think we last amended our rules on, um, on public financing in 1991. Um, and and the, the Congress really needs to act if they want this system to be viable. There are proposals uh, in Congress to lift the cap, for example, and change it from the current system to a six for one uh, matching system for small donations, akin to what they do in New York City. Uh, but, you know, even, even with the um, even with the changes that have been contemplated, should they ever actually get adopted? And as you know, it that would be quite an uphill climb to get that statute passed. It's still not clear that public financing uh, would be able to keep up with the vast sums of money that are being raised and spent. I mean, I was just talking about the candidate money, but obviously post Citizens United, there are also super PACs out there that can accept unlimited funds. And there are people out there who spend literally millions of dollars of their own money uh, on various campaigns to try and get other people elected through super PACs. So uh, that it's it's very hard. We're trying to take some steps to try and make it um, more approachable, more accessible for people to at least break into politics more at the congressional level than perhaps at the presidential level. Uh, in the last few years, the commission has approved a couple of AOs that make it easier for uh, candidates to use campaign funds to pay childcare expenses. So if they have kids that they need to take care of and they don't want to drag them along with them as they're campaigning door to door, they can use campaign funds to uh, to pay for that. And we're currently looking at, we're in the middle of a rulemaking that would hopefully expand candidates' abilities to draw a salary from their campaign. Again, making it more accessible for people who have not been in the paid workforce or have been in the paid workforce at um, at, at very um, low levels, uh, at, at low, low salary jobs. So, um, you know, we are, we are trying to make it easier for people to at least break into Congress, but the the amounts of money that are that are required to run for office are just astronomical. Can I can I interject a second in the chat earlier and not related to to you, but earlier they were talking about the issue of child care and funding for or allowing funding for child care, but also said, well, what about because women are mostly the, the people who take care of seniors and take care of uh, family members with disabilities. What about them? Has no, the, yeah. that is a great question. Uh, and uh, yes, it has been raised in the con in the construct of um, in the context, sorry, of childcare. But uh, I am fairly confident that that same ruling would apply to people who are engaged in elder care or any other kind of uh, mm -hmm. care for uh, for a disabled relative of any age, you know, what whatever your care needs are. I think that the principle that the commission adopted would be easily extended to those uh, to those other situations. Okay. Um, so Christina, can you answer the same question that I asked Ellen about um, sort of what what you think at the local level has been an issue in campaign financing and, and any potential changes? Well, um, first off, thank you uh, so much for having me. And um, the little political science uh, geek in my heart is kind of like lettering that I'm on a panel with both of you. Um, and so, you know, I, I think on the state and local level, we have the similar challenges that Ellen was talking about for the congressional and presidential races. Um, I was recently uh, in a fellowship that brings together, you know, lots of elected uh, leaders from across the country. And I was talking to the, the Secretary of State for Oregon, and she was mentioning that there are no campaign finance limits in Oregon. And what does that mean? And what does that look like from a perspective of who can compete, um, who can raise, and who can participate and run for office in that process? Um, so we deal with some of the still Miller challenges, <clears throat> and I think one of the things that um, has become more so is that as we are seeing more and more of the what I'll call culture wars happening, we are actually seeing an increased uh, amount of money, PACs, uh, 
tracks and things like that on smaller races, like school board, for instance. Um, I think in Wake County, North Carolina, a few years ago, the, the amount of money spent on school board races uh, rivaled that of what you would have spent for a state Senate race um, or a you know small congressional race um, in that area. And I think that that has an implication for, again, what does democracy mean, but who gets to represent whom and who gets to participate in that process? Right. Uh, unfortunately, there are no solutions to that, correct? <laughs> Well, I mean, I think there are some solutions that folks can do. So in the District of Columbia, for instance, we have a fair elections program, um, which is a small dollar match program similar to New York. Um, so in the district, for instance, my race, I represent the whole city I ran at large. The maximum contribution you can give me is $100. And for any DC resident, that contribution is matched five to one. There is no way that I would have been able to run for an open citywide seat as a first time candidate without participating in public financing. Um, but if I'm going to be honest, it was an experiment. Um, the first election cycle that we did this was in 2020. Um, interestingly enough, uh, when I was a staffer for the council, this was the very first bill that I worked on. Um, and, you know, I didn't see a path forward. I ended up changing jobs. And then, you know, interestingly enough, when I decide to run for office, I get to benefit from this program that um, I started a conversation on um, many years ago. But, you know, again, it was an experiment. Can you run a citywide race in a fairly expensive media market? Um, and and when toss in a pandemic and here you <laughs> you have a a perfect storm um it went well enough i think that we saw in 2022 then you have um both mayoral both top mayoral candidates who participated in public financing for the first time you saw the attorney general candidates who were participating um, in the district um, in public financing and frankly for voters it was a signal in terms of your values were you a fair elections candidate or were you participating in the old system that we still do have in place? But I think for voters, um, it signals something in terms of your values, but also how you planned or wanted to use your time in a campaign. Um, I used to be a, I, I worked for Emily's List back in the day. So I used to be a call time manager. Um, <laughs> people hate call time. <laughs> hate it with a passion, try to do everything possible to get out of call time. Um, I didn't have that experience because of fair elections, right? Um, any interaction that I was having with a voter was also an opportunity to have a conversation with a donor. Um, and I think for voters, they felt like for the first time they were able to participate in the process, but they also were on the same footing as any corporation or any business owner. Um, they can give me a hundred dollars. And so they are just as important or, you know, as your contribution but also the match too. Let's say you don't have hundred dollars. I think for some voters and donors, I'm now going to call them donors, right? We bring them into the political process in that way. If you give 20 bucks for them to know, oh, it's going to get matched five to one, they see the value even in their small contribution. And so I think that this is an innovative, I am, I am any place I go where people are like, what can we do to help get more women and minorities um, into the political office? And I say, you need to public financing scheme in your, your jurisdiction. Does that scheme, um, once, once the uh, candidate has already had the five times match, uh, can they no longer uh, ask for money from uh, individuals? No, so the, the only caps that we have is the amount of matching contributions mm -hmm. that you can receive, but you can continue to accept, but you can only accept small dollar donations. So. Um, as a district, you know, candidate, I can accept, say, contributions from someone who is in South Carolina that won't get matched. Once I hit the match cap, I can still receive donations, but they won't, they just won't be matched. Mm -hmm. That's interesting. Uh, on the question of public financing, Ellen, I'm just curious, has there been thought, and I know that this would involve Congress in many ways, but have been have there been thoughts about ways of altering that federal system, particularly not just for presidential candidates, but Congress and, and to, to make a difference? I, I think so. You know, the problem is getting something passed. There, there were right. proposals that were incorporated in, into HR1, the omnibus um, mm -hmm. uh, 
pro-democracy bill that was uh, introduced in the last Congress that would have addressed public financing. I think they wanted to start a pilot program for congressional candidates uh, also mm -hmm. using public financing. And again, to take the caps off and to um, turn it more into a New York style um, six for one matching program. It's, it's the caps that are really killers. If there's a cap on your expenditures, you are not going to be able to compete, compete effectively. Um, John McCain learned that lesson in the in the 2000s. Yes. Uh, exactly. <clears throat> so I have a unique question that's kind of somewhat unrelated, but it is um, obviously the FEC was intended when it was enacted to be the disclosure agency that was going to make it transparency for the American public so they would know who was behind campaign uh, contributions. And uh, while the FEC does a good job of having that on their website, um, most of the people in the American public don't ever look at the FEC website, nor do they, uh, surprising, nor yeah, do they know she it all the time. She's an election nerd, I can tell. <laughs> okay. Christina, you can give your response in a minute. But um, I, it has occurred to me, uh, because I think transparency is so important. And when people know who's behind some of these things, um, it really impacts how they vote. Uh, no question about it. And so my, my question is, would there ever be a possibility for the FEC to have some other mechanism of more publicly providing that information uh, so on whether it be on media, social media, or in some other way that is what people go to now for their information so that they will know who is trying to influence their vote. Well, as you know, Anne, um, hmm. it's a uh, six person commission. <laughs> within three from any one political party and um, broadening the scope of our activities would require the agreement of um, at least four of those commissioners. So that's always, as you know, a bit of an uphill battle. We, we do use, um, we have uh, webinars that we run on YouTube. We've got our own YouTube channel. Um, I, I'm on Twitter and uh, also these days on Mastodon and, um, trying to figure out post. I haven't quite been there yet. Um, so the, and, and the agency itself has a Twitter account and we put out a uh, weekly digest with all of our activities and with all of the um, uh, press releases that we put out, we put out uh, periodic summaries of what's going on in, in disclosure. But I, I do think that um, we, we have to work in partnership with traditional media with great nonprofit organizations like Open Secrets. Um, that, that's one of my favorite websites. Uh, they do that's such- good at them on the board. Oh, great. <laughs> well, you're doing a great job. Um, yeah. I mean, they they have been doing a great job for years and they, you know, they perform a slightly different function than we do. They they crunch the numbers, they, they take all the data that we collect and make available to the public and they analyze it in ways that you know, probably would be harder for us to get consensus to to do at the FEC. But I, you know, I think that's fine. We do what we do well, and uh, and they do what they do very well. And then we rely on journalists to uh, who who do spend. We get a lot of hits on our website. Actually, we get a surprising number of hits on our website, and uh, a lot of journalists do pay attention. And then, of course, as you know, in politics. Often what gets publicized is publicized by your opponent. Uh, there's a lot of oppo research that goes on by using the data on our mm -hmm. website. So, you know, could we do a more effective job of getting the information out? Uh, sure. Um, I, I think that's always true. But I think that we have to acknowledge how we as a government agency are able to uh, perform our function and um, uh, and as I said, rely on the good work of journalists and NGOs and um, and other political actors to help draw out the most important uh, data that is uh, that right. is. In I see I see articles in the press on the front pages of the press about the information that's on our website all the time. Yes. No. I I think that's right. 
um, particularly in DC, you will see that. But I, I think the problem is um, somehow, and, and Open Secrets does do that work, but they generally will write some articles and it goes only out to their um, constituents, people who, are, who follow them. I, so just in some degree, I feel that when there is greater transparency of these um, issues, that it will cause much more concern and understanding by the public about it. And, and, and can yes. I add, um, yeah, I would just please. say that I think some of this is an opportunity to embed it in conversations around misinformation and disinformation in terms of how we educate mm -hmm. young people or the next round of political donors, right? What does the paid for line mean? And mm -hmm. what do you do when you're interested in learning more? Um, being in the DC media market, <clears throat> we often get all kinds of political ads that have nothing to do with candidates in our region, um, where it's groups, advocacy groups who are trying to push a particular agenda mm -hmm. nationwide. Uh, I often sometimes I like I'll hear an ad and I'm like, wait, who paid for that? And then that's when you sort of go to sort of look for that information. But I think for how many people in the American public know to look at who paid for something and then use that yeah. as a spring off point to understand a little bit more mm -hmm. around what their agenda might be. Yeah, no, I agree with you. I think that's and, really- And you know, and, well, I think the agency does a, a very good job of taking the data that it has and, and um, uh, getting it up on the website. And it is just a phenomenal amount of, of data. There are groups and individuals out there who go to extraordinary lengths to actually hide the ball from us and oh, to try sure. who the uh, ultimate donor is. I know you, you saw that in California as well as at yeah. the FEP, and you will not be shocked to hear it is still happening. Yeah, <laughs> no, I am not not shocked at all. Uh, that's the that's the problem. Any any chance the FEC will be reformed? Uh, it, it, that um, HR one, which you mentioned, is there <laughs> any possibility? Do you think? In Congress, well, that, that, be that, was another, that was another provision in HR one was FEC reform. Um, yes, it was. Uh, it, I, I'm. That's, a, that's well. A, you're I, there. I'm just asking your opinion. It's, <laughs> it's, it's, it's as you know, it's a, it's an uphill battle to get anything passed in right. con, on campaign. I, I mean, you know, I was, I was really disappointed that the Freedom to Vote Act um, didn't didn't end up getting passed, that would have been such a good improvement. Uh, and there are measures like the Disclose Act and the Honest Ads Act that do have some bipartisan support um, uh, that would really help us to do our job better, you know, putting aside the issue of how many commissioners there should be and some of the nitty gritty of how the commission right. operates. Um, well, I see Katie now and I know she gave me the two minute warning I think I'm beyond the two minute, minute warning. So thank you, Katie, and thank you, Christina and Ellen for participating in this um, panel. It's certainly something that is so important to the American public that I wish it were easier to make change. Thank you both. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, thank you all so much. And it's really a little bit heartbreaking to have to um, to have to jump on and in the conversation. And you know, again, truly, what what a gift, what a joy to be able to sit in and listen to three of our nation's leading experts on campaign finance chat about what they care about. So thank you all so much for joining us. And um, again, we are going to move right into our final panel, um, just as we did yesterday. We're going to wrap up today with a discussion of um, on solutions by learning exactly what action steps we can take from a panel of on the ground experts who are working out there in states, in communities to advance the solutions that we have been talking about today. Um, and for this panel, there will be a Q&A session at the end. So please use that Q&A feature in Zoom. Um, you can also upvote questions if you see any questions that other people have posed that you would also like to see answered. Um, and unfortunately, our, our moderator, Jessica Haller of New Majority New York City is unable to make it today, but we are so happy to have Represent Women's very own research associate, Marvelous Maeze, stepping in to moderate this panel. We are also going to be joined by Brittany Buford, Managing Partner for Partnerships, 
at Partners in Democracy. We also have Luba Gretchen Shirley, founder and CEO of Vote Mama Foundation, and Lorian Sales, Montgomery County Council member there in Maryland. Um, marvelous. I will let you take it from here. Thank you so much, Katie. And hello, everyone. I hope you're enjoying the second day of our Solutions Summit. And while are you all in for quite a treat today? We will be finishing off day two stronger than ever as we are joined by an esteemed panel of on the ground experts that will share their experience working to advance ranked choice voting for presidential elections. And we'll also continue our conversation about innovations and in campaign financing. Now, I want to give you a little bit more of a reintroduction into our panelists. First, we, of course, we have Brittany Buford, who, among her long list of impressive accomplishments, is currently a managing partner of partnerships at Partner in democracy. She specializes in data-driven relation uh, organizing, door-to-door -door canvassing programs, and public affairs. We're also joined by Luva Gretchen Shirley, founder and CEO of the Vote Mama Foundation, whose decision to petition the Federal Election Commission breathe fresh life into a discussion linking campaign finance to family issues like child care and paid family leave. And last but certainly not least, we'll hear from Lorianne Sales, a monk Montgomery County Council member in Maryland who has broken down barriers, glass ceilings, and in my opinion is a shining example of the first generation American dream. I want to extend a warm welcome to all of you. Hi. <laughs> All right, so the implementation of RCV is typically associated with state level elections, but as it's proven over time to be a viable option for voters, discussions have turned towards its implementation at the federal level with the highest elected office in our executive branch, the presidency. As our panelists all know, five states used RCV in the 2020 Democratic Party presidential primaries. Alaska, Hawaii, Kansas, and Wyoming used it for all voters, and Nevada for absentee T caucus voters. Just this past November, Alaska voted to implement it for general, the general presidential election. So my first question to our panelists is for you to give us examples of some of the best strategies being used at the municipal level to advance ranked choice voting in presidential primaries. And or you can also touch on the best strategies being used to encourage fair campaign financing. So you can talk about one or the other, both. And if you have any examples of how these solutions have improved elections in states, please feel free to share any exciting advancements happening at the municipal level. Um, I'm going to start with Brittany because you're right on my screen. <laughs> And then we'll move on. <laughs> Thanks so much for having me. Um, so yeah, implement best practices. I wouldn't say have best practices, but I do have key things that tend to play into RCV and the ability to pass and, and get people invested in rank choice. Um, and some of those things are paying attention to housing and language justice. It really is about cross-sectionality um, and showing that by way of RCV, there is a uh, probability of things improving in other areas beyond just voting. Uh, a lot of the challenge comes from people not seeing how their vote and how RCV affects them on a daily basis. And by, by cross-sectioning, uh, talking about language justice and, and ensuring that everyone um, is able to be involved, how it affects housing and how uh, we all know of, of the issues with, with housing and rental and, um, and being able to do mail-in ballots and automatic voter registration and all of those barriers that come in housing um, justice that transition into voting and RCV. So being aware of those, uh, learning to partner with organizations who are able to reach those um, demographics affected is really important. Awesome. Um, Lorianne, do you want to go? And then Liuba, you can kind of like talk us into financial. Yeah, she knows. Here we go. Oh, so am I answering the same question or the? Sure. Yeah. Or if anything, yes. if it kind of spurred any ideas for you. Well, first, um, I really want to thank Represent Women for hosting this event, um, especially on International Women's History Day. So um, I'm really grateful to be here with my fellow panelists. And thank you, Marvelous, uh, for moderating this discussion. 
Um, you know, it's so important for us as women uh, to collaborate with leaders from across the country. And so it's just uh, an honor to be here today and hear the different perspectives from women who are in similar roles. Um, we know how important ranked choice voting and public financing are to leveling the playing field. And they've had a tremendous uh, impact on making it easier for women to lead run for office and win. So I'm just really grateful to be here today. Um, I live in Montgomery County, Maryland. And in 2022, last year, November, I was fortunate enough to uh, become the first black woman elected to the Montgomery County Council at large. Um, we don't have ranked choice voting in the county, but we do have it in one of our uh, neighboring municipalities, um, Tacoma Park, and then in the state of Maryland, um, they've adopted a public financing campaign that has helped increase the more diverse slate of candidates. Um, we elected the um, uh, greatest um, segment of women um, in this most recent election. We're actually the majority, six out of 11 members are all women and all the new members are women. Um, and so I made a point in my campaign to use public funds and to ensure that um, I fueled a people powered campaign that was um, centered around a smart agenda, which is my acronym for strengthening our commitment to education, making a living in our county more affordable, advancing local food production, and um, revitalizing our economy post pandemic and tackling climate change. Um, and so these programs um, in addition to leveling the playing field, ensure that people play um, a stronger role in their democracy. And we're not um, funding candidates who are driven by big money in politics. Perfect, thank you. Go ahead, Leva. Um, well, thank you for having me. Uh, listening, to, listening to Ellen speak right now brings me back to five years ago now, um, when I put the request in to the Federal Election Commission to ask if I could use some of the funds that I was raising for my campaign on child care, everyone said I was nuts. They said it was political suicide. They said I was going to be attacked for being a woman and a mother. Mm -hmm. And I remember driving down to DC with my my two toddlers in the backseat, my husband, and being really nervous and thinking if they say no tomorrow, I have no idea how to continue this campaign because I had given up my salary to run. My mom was still teaching at the time and she would watch our children at 3.30 when she got home, but I was nursing two babies. I had two babies on the campaign trail with me and it's not sustainable. There is a reason that we have more men named John in the Senate than moms of minor children. And we put this request in and to my surprise, Hillary Clinton and 24 members of Congress supported it. And I remember being really nervous and listening to Ellen say, we wish somebody had made this request earlier. And it was amazing. Um, and it, it that decision, it was a unanimous bipartisan decision, but it changed the way that people run for office. It changed the way that parents run for office. And we've now seen so many candidates use campaign funds for child care in this 2022 cycle. We are, we are crunching the numbers now, but we are set to have more funding used this last cycle than the last two cycles. And we've Prior to the 2022 cycle, we had 59 federal candidates who had used campaign funds for child care, over 100 if you include state candidates. And now Vote Mama Foundation, the organization I started after my campaign, has been working to actually get this approved for state and local candidates. So I'm glad that someone brought up dependent care because that's the gold standard of the legislation we're introducing right now is not just child care, but dependent care as well. And we're at 28 states who have now approved this 16 through legislation and the rest through either uh, an attorney general ruling, a secretary of state decision or an ethics ruling. And I will tell you in the last week, I've heard from two different candidates, one who had already announced and one who was about to announce who dropped out and one who decided not to run because of uh, care for her two children and one because of care for her elderly mother. And I will tell you in the last week, I've seen it twice. And that is that is the reality for women across this country who want to step up and run. Caregiving gets in the way and it's difficult. And if we can make one small financial change, one small decision can actually completely transform the political landscape and make it possible for working parents and working people to run for office. 
So I am excited to be here to talk about it more. Thank you so much. You all made such wonderful points to get this kicked off. Um, Laurieann kind of touched on the importance of getting people involved, that the point of democracy is to ensure that everyone is engaged. And so I really wanted to ask you guys, how can you ensure that states um, assure voters that RCV is a way to have a more equitable voting process and, you know, not just another attempt to disen disenfranchise voters, particularly because in the past, particularly with voters of color, voters that are perhaps a part of our disabled community, et cetera, um, they have been left to the wayside. And I think particularly this is applicable when it comes to um, voters who've had their concerns throughout our nation's long history of systemic oppression and disenfranchisement at the ballot, they've been disproportionately impacted. So uh, I just wanted to hear your thoughts on that. And you can also take the opposing view because on the other hand, we've had cases like RCV and NYC who the original moderator, Jessica Holler, who I know very well, she's great, <laughs> was gonna talk about that. And when they implemented it in New York City, the opposite happened and we were able to elect more women to office, women of color to office. So take either side and just kind of discuss if you think that um, RCV would benefit or be a benefit or a detriment to women who are running for president in future elections? We'll go in the same order. We'll start with Brittany. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I, um, you know, like RCV is something that over time we've learned certain ways and certain methods of implementation. And part of that is, is learning that when you uh, get it done at the municipal or local level, it tends to catch on and then you can push for the state and, and such. Um, and so I think that's exactly how you do all of this. People are about seeing the reality of how, how things work. Um, they don't want to hear our take on this. They want to see finite um, results. And they and so using um, examples like New York City, using examples like uh, Cambridge, Massachusetts, who has been using um, an RCV system for nearly 100 years, um, places like Portland, Oregon, who have implemented it, and then going to states like Washington, um, who are set up to have eventual RCV, um, using all of those uh, those examples and giving strict data um, is why oftentimes a lot of people feel like when you go into these communities, they may not understand this data, or that because they haven't been involved thus far, um, they're, you know, behind on, on what this means. Um, this is about education. Um, this is about education in the democracy system, um, involvement in the democracy system. So the more that we open uh, the system to others, uh, make sure that they have the availability of childcare to become part of the system, make sure that uh, we are pushing towards automatic voter registration in these states and giving them access to understand RCV, to understand um, how democracy can work and how it can work best for them is super important. And that's just done with, with data and figuring out what messaging um, really relates to them and making sure that they are able to have that, whether that's in the language that they understand or whether that message encompasses the culture or the environment that they're in. Perfect. Thank you so much, Lorian. Yeah, I would say that um, the ranked choice voting eliminates the idea of uh, a spoiler candidate. Um, I feel like you get the opportunity for, you know, the candidate with the um, best messaging and the candidate with the most support across, you know, an entire electorate, not just, um, you know, um, voters who are excited about um, uh, one particular candidate, they get to spread their, um, their support across the candidates. Um, it's also an opportunity for um, people of color to get more consideration as a serious candidate. Um, I 
think that, you know, when you're in a really tight race and um, we're having a lot of that happening now with a new governor who is um, recruiting a lot of uh, delegates from the state house that so we're having to fill a lot of the positions. And so we get to see the appointment process play out like ranked choice voting. Um, and so it really forces the candidate to build that base of support. Um, and I, I feel like it's a fair way to ensure that your vote isn't wasted. Luckily in my race, um, there were four candidates that um, four out of eight candidates um, that secured the four at-large positions. And so, um, you know, if we didn't have this ranking, even though in the primary, I finished in second place, I finished in fourth place in the general, I finished in fourth place. Um, you had more time to build your base. And I feel like this gives uh, weaker candidates an opportunity to um, ensure that votes aren't wasted and um, really spreads um, your options uh, across the broader spectrum and helps with leveling the playing field as well. Thank you so much, Lorianne. I actually want to alter the question a little bit before I toss it over to Liuba so we can focus more on campaign finance and funding. Um, how do you feel for you from a candidate's perspective doing equitable reforms creates more fairness in the process? And then if you could also touch on, uh, I guess, what you see is some of the more promising avenues for accountability as far as fighting corruption in campaign finance so that it benefits, you know, um, women of color, people who are kind of disenfranchised due to socioeconomical issues and that kind of stratification. Uh, yeah, so go ahead with that. Yeah, it's oh. it's interesting. I, I spoke on a panel um, right after my campaign with, I think like, eight other congressional candidates who had run in 2018. And someone asked us which ones of us plan to run again. And honestly, there were a lot of people. Uh, I think there was one white man who said, yes, I plan to run again. And everybody else said, I maxed out my credit cards. I took out a second mortgage on my house. I took money out of my retirement account. A lot of us went into debt to run for Congress. And most of us said we weren't planning to run again. And I was pregnant with my third child. And I honestly could not could not fathom going through that again. And I had already launched Vote Mama and thought I could make more of a difference building this organization than I could with one vote in a, in a pretty red district. And the reality is that so many people want to step up and run and they don't have the financial resources. You don't realize when you run for Congress that you can't work a full-time job. You have to be running for Congress full-time if you have any chance of winning. And most people will run for a year and a half at least, sometimes two years. So very few people have the ability to pay your bills and to actually support a family and to continue to run without earning an income. And that completely skews the perspective in the decision-making uh, positions of power, because if you have, we have more millionaires in Congress right now than we have moms. And we have policies that are failing moms and children across this country. Uh, Navila Islam, who is now a state senator in Georgia, uh, she put a request in when she was running for Congress. She ran for Congress in the middle of a pandemic without health care without any health insurance. So she put a request in and I, I'm actually testifying in two weeks in front of the FEC about this. There are three things that this new request will do. One, it expands campaign funds for childcare to dependent care officially. Two, it actually allows candidates to use their campaign funds for healthcare because there are so many people who run, if you are not married to a partner who has health insurance, you don't have health insurance for the most part if you're running for Congress, you can't really afford it. And then, the third thing, which I think is amazing, is the salaries. Right now, technically, you can take a salary from your campaign, but there are stipulations. One, it has to be less money than you earned the year before. And two, you have to have made it onto the ballot. Most candidates are running for at least a full year before they make the ballot. So what are you supposed to do before then? And the fact that you have to take less money than you earned the year before that completely eliminates the fact that caregivers could possibly run or somebody who might have been unemployed for some part of the last year can't take a salary. So this excludes working people across the country from stepping up and running for Congress. The change would actually allow you to draw funds as a salary from the dollars that you're raising for your campaign the second you actually file papers. That is an absolute game changer. It will change who runs for Congress. I am so excited that this is even coming before the FEC. I cannot wait to testify. And this, this is how we change what politics looks like. We have 
We are 27th in education globally. We're 27th in healthcare. We are the only industrialized country without universal healthcare or paid family leave. Our maternal mortality rates dropped 75% in the last 20 years. Why? Because we have people in office who don't understand any of these issues at a visceral level because it's not their lived experience. Legislators legislate based on their lived experience. If we want to change our policies, we have to change our policy makers. And the only way to do that is to change these structural barriers that hold working people back from running. So I am so excited to testify in two weeks and I hope I hope the FEC makes, and I'm, I'm sure they will, will make another really great decision. You know, I, I just wanted to yeah, yeah. respond if there's time. You know, um, I didn't even know that you could draw down a salary from, you know, the money you raised. Me raising $180,000 was um, monumental in and of itself. And that was only because of our county's matching program. And all of that money went into mailing my universe and ensuring that I had the um, you know, like the uh, marketing materials, my palm cards, my t-shirts, and all of those very important um, opportunities to touch people. And so, you know, um, while I know it's a sacrifice, um, it's interesting that, you know, you would, um, your budget would allow for that sort of uh, sacrifice with, you know, sharing the necessary money to get your message out to, I have to now, you know, use this money to support myself. And I mean, um, yeah, if we want to get the right people in office, we're going to have to change policies. But I know that when we made our campaign budget, you know, we had 1.1 million residents to reach. And so every penny counted when getting the vote out. Um, and so, yeah, it's a, it's a conjury of challenging decisions. Yeah, this this salary is for federal candidates. So federal candidates are allowed to use their they're allowed to use some of the funds that they're raising for their campaign on salaries, but almost no one does it because of the stigma that they will be attacked. And it does put you at a at a disadvantage because people who don't need to take a salary to live are using that money to go out and pay for more mailers and more TV ads. So you do need to raise more funds to be able to pay yourself a salary or to be able to use some of those funds for childcare. Um, I was asked a question once about, about our babysitter during the campaign. And I made the comment that our babysitter was just as important as my campaign manager. And I got a lot, I got a lot of help from that from my campaign manager. She teased me about it forever, but it was true. I could either hire people to go on out and knock on doors for, for me to talk to voters, or I could hire a babysitter mm -hmm. so that I could go out and talk to voters myself. Mm -hmm. So it's it's that balance and you have to make that decision. And it means you have to raise more money to be successful, but it's how we get working people to run. Yeah. And I just want to jump in because I think you made a really good point. Well, a really good connection just now as as myself being a former campaign manager, having worked closely with candidates, both at the federal level and at, you know, local municipalities. Um, one of the things is that the push for child care at the federal level has significance in trickle down effect. Um, this is not just a push for candidates. This is a push for residents who want to be involved and see ceilings and barriers in their way, even before they get to the point of candidacy. Um, you know, I spent 15 years working in campaigns. Campaign managers, as you guys are probably well aware, end up working sometimes 90 hours a week. Um, we put in work. <laughs> and for myself, I, you know, I started in this field as a single parent. I have two kids. And the number of times that my oldest uh, was dragged along with me, whether it was door knocking or filing papers or working with the, with the candidate to get whatever needed was done. Um, part of why women, part of why people of color don't get involved is because they see these ceilings and they see the barriers ahead of them. And it's discouraging. And so by pushing the ability for candidates to use funding for salaries, for childcare, for being able to see pathways forward in candidacy is super important. And it's important for residents who want to get involved from the beginning, not just when they are ready to file. 
Thank you guys so much. It's so important to understand the converging points between trying to achieve gender parity and then also these economic, these very real economic issues that all of us deal with in the real world, um, just trying to get through day-to-day -day life. Uh, you, I think we have like time for one more question before we move on to Q&A, but I wanna make it one that is hopefully motivational, inspirational, and uplifting. Um, Brittany just talked about her kids. <laughs> I know a few of you, you guys also have kids. And I, I was wondering, you know, we've been having a very policy-driven conversation today um, about these topics, but I would love it if you could all share your views on how you would explain the importance of RCV for presidential elections, as well as the issue of campaign finance reform for the next generation. You know, how would you explain this to Gen Z, to your kids, to your nieces, to your nephews, because they're really the ones that will be inheriting these topics voting on the legislation and spearheading future campaigns. You know, they're going to be our future donors. So how is it that you would inspire them to get involved and understand the significance of this topic? Well, um, like Brittany, I dragged my daughter with me on the campaign trail. So she was knocking doors, stuffing <clears throat> envelopes, and going to political events. And so um, she's not interested in politics at all. <laughs> like, bless your heart, enjoy. And, you know, I'll get her to do a few hours at the polls during um, voting times. But um, I know how important the next generation is and how important it is for us to strengthen the pipeline of, um, you know, young activists. So, you know, my first initiative was to create a youth council. We just launched it this week. Um, and it's a mixture, thank you, of um, young people from 13 to um, 18 at our um, school system. And so um, part of even making decisions, we're going to be doing ranked choice voting because we're going to be thinking about different initiatives we wanna support. Um, we've already created committees based around my SMART agenda. And so letting them know that there's power in their voice and that there is um, benefits to being creative in how we um, uh, advance our democracy um, and that it ensures that more people can participate, more candidates can get support. Um, I think those are ways that you can, you know, really hone in on how um, impactful ranked choice voting is and how it's easier. Most of the 16 students that are in the council are mostly young women. So that was reassuring to see. We only have two uh, guys in the class. And so I'm excited about the future of our democracy. And I know that um, we're only our, our sacrifices and our, um, you know, um, uh, confidence and ability to run and put our names on the ballot is only going to um, encourage other young women who are coming behind us to take the same leap of faith. My kids, I don't want to say they love politics, but they're so comfortable with it at this point that they're just, they, they get it. One of my favorite moments for my campaign was my daughter we were, we were actually at the governor's um, bill signing for paid family leave in New York. And it was New Year's Eve. And she looked at me and she was, she was young at the time. She was three. And she said, mama, why aren't you speaking? She was used to me speaking at everything. And I said, it's not my event, baby. And she, she ran up to the podium afterwards and she made me pick her up and she had a Peppa Pig dress on and she gave her own speech. And then we were invited. I was, I was a, a surrogate for Elizabeth Warren and they called me on like a Friday afternoon and they said, can you fly to Iowa today? And I said, I will, if I can bring my daughter. And I called Mila at school and I'm like, do you want to go to Iowa today? And she of course wanted to go and she came with me and she stumped for Elizabeth Warren. And she still holds it over my husband that Iowa is the one state that she has been to that he hasn't been to. And she thinks it's the greatest <laughs> thing ever. And she's always just been around it. She talks to moms. I mean, my kids, I'm surprised they haven't come up yet, but they always just come in and talk to moms who are running across the country that we're working with. And they just think that's the norm. And my, my son came in one day and I was working and he looks at me and he sits down on my couch. I, I was admiring everybody's backgrounds and you all have the nicest backgrounds. And I have my couch that was like my grad school present to myself. And I'm like, I got to change my background. But he throws himself on the couch and he looks at me and he goes, mama, are you working? And I said, yes, baby. He goes, 
Are you making the world a better place for me and Mila? And this is before Andrew was born. And I got all teary eyed and I turned around and I said, that's what I'm trying to do. And that's what they're growing up knowing that that's what my work is. And they know that that's what politics is. And they talk politics at the dinner table and they try to explain it to their two-year-old little brother. And it's really funny to listen to, but they named Vote Mama. They used to scream Vote Mama all the time, which is why I started Vote Mama, because that's what they used to say. So the more you talk politics and the more you expose them to it, the more they'll just kind of grow up with that understanding of their voice is really important and they better get out there and do something about the policies that are happening right now. Yeah, absolutely. And I love that all of our kids are are so involved in our processes. Um, mine are, are 15 and seven. And my 15 year old is just a few years off from voting. He is talking about getting his license now and moving into the world. Um, and for him, you know, I have, I also have a ton of nieces and nephews who are the same age. So all of, there's like seven of them that are all 15, 16, 17. And we talk politics all the time. Um, my son, any campaign I work, I'm like, you're making phone calls. You're just showing them that they have an onus of responsibility, um, to be involved in democracy and to show them why it matters why it like being part of this democracy helps to change the things in school that you come home every day and you complain to me about. Um, it helps to keep the things that you love about school. So these democracy is affecting you right now and, and being able to show them that in action um, is super important. And then there's other kids like my seven year old year old who um, is I'm surprised she hasn't come in. She has an opinion about everything. Um, and she is probably more political than I am at this point and, and democracy driven. Um, and so to plant that seed with, with our young kids and being able to um, have more women and more people in general involved in democracy who are able to plant that seed and, and give direction to the next generation and being responsible and being responsive um, to the democracy that they want is super important. And, and I love to see that um, all of us on here today are, are pushing towards that. Thank you guys so much. I could not have asked for a better panel today. Your words have encouraged us. They've reminded us why we all work so hard to ensure that we are creating fairness and equity in this process. Um, for all of our audience members, we're about to move on to the Q&A section. Before we do, though, I really want to just um, tell everyone to make sure you're checking out the chat. We have a lot of incredible information that's being posted there by our fearless leader, Cynthia. Uh, lots of great stats as well as reports that we've written and um, information about our panelists and the work that they're working on. So let's get started with these questions, shall we? Our first question, what can states do to who, oh, what can states do who have legislators who are reluctant to make changes? You guys, how are you going to push the old guard? <laughs> to do the right thing. <laughs> what can states do or what can people do? I think maybe what they meant is what can people do or representatives of states, individuals, leaders like you guys, what can happen at the higher level? Um, well, at the grassroots level, call your legislators. Call your legislators. Right now, if you actually go to Vote Mama Lobby on Instagram, we have action items for every state. We have 18 bills live right now in 12 states for campaign funds for child care. And there are the scripts, there are phone scripts, there are letters that you can sign on to. So you can go ahead and take those actions right now to help us actually get campaign funds for child care passed in those states. Um, but in terms of every other piece of legislation that you can do, we're going to be working on paid family leave for state legislators, virtual voting, virtual committee hearings, ways to break down those structural barriers. Call your state legislators. Make your voice heard. Tell them that you care about these issues because when they hear from you, they're more uh, they're more apt to actually take action. They need to know that their constituents care about these issues. So keep calling, keep emailing, be annoying if you must. I'm very good at doing that. I used to call my representatives all the time and then I ran against one of them, but keep calling. I, I would agree. Um, you know, I give a talk every year to our Community Advocacy Institute um, a training program for grassroots um, advocates. 
that um, are recruited from the community. They apply for this uh, year long program and then they testify before the county council. But I give a presentation on advocacy and how important it is to just reach out to your representative, whether it's you know your city council member, your board of education member. Our board of ed gets half of our county's uh, multi-billion dollar budget. And so, you know, we have very close relationships with our state and federal partners. And so I, you know, think it's, uh, um, you know, you're so fortunate to have um, these uh, immediate pathways to communicate your needs, frontline needs, people who are on the ground with the people who are closest to uh, the decision-making power. And so um, you can, call their office, you can send in testimony on any particular bill and also follow what you're passionate about. You know, I started out with my PTA, the NAACP Parent Council. And so this is how you start to see on the ground how responsive your legislators can be. Um, and it's, they're really just a phone call away. We work for you. And I think um, sometimes they feel like some elusive, individual that can't be touched but um you know with social media and now that we're outside of the pandemic i mean you can meet your legislators at any any given moment and so sign up for that public hearing go to their community event and make sure that your voice is heard the squeaky wheel gets the oil can I yeah. add on to that really quickly? Sorry. When you just said they seem like these elusive people, um, I will tell you the one thing I really learned from running for office. I used to think that these people, everybody who was in Congress in particular, I thought they knew everything. I thought they were really yes. smart. I thought they mm -hmm. understood all of these issues. And I was shocked to find out that they hadn't. They don't. They don't know these things. In the first debate I had to do, Peter King had been in office since I was 12, literally almost 30 years. And I ran against him in my first debate. I was so nervous. And this is a man who had, you know, done this before. He did not know the issues. He did not understand them. He didn't care to understand them. And I kicked his butt in five debates. And the point <laughs> is, as long as you care and you can read, you can understand the issues. And as long as you talk to people in your district and you understand what they care about, you can run for office. Yeah. So you don't only just have to call your representatives, you can run for office yourself because they really don't know all that much and you probably know more and you can probably do a better job than your current electeds. Sorry, go ahead. <laughs> Brittany, you can answer, I'll be quiet. <laughs> No, no, no. That is the the perfect. I think both of you answered it just perfectly. Um, you know, pay attention to testimony, even if you can't attend testimony. Um, look to see if your state has uh, testimony available, which um, unfortunately not all states make it easily accessible or have it. So it's going to very much depend on on what state you're from. But look for those things. Um, check in with your your representatives, write them, email them, be active on Twitter, keep bothering them um, because you're one of many trying to get answers, but uh, just remain on top of it. And even if you can't give your time in this, there are ways to stay involved, whether that is again, through like Twitter or writing or, you know, being involved um, as Lorianne said, um, for your like PTA, um, NAACP, all of these are avenues to uh, your representatives. Thank you guys so much. And just, oh, do you want more? Go. Can I go. have one more. I'm go. sorry. So I also, I just wanted to let you guys know and talking about getting involved. We launched Vote Mama Lobby uh, just last September, and this is an app that we created. So you can literally go to the app store and just search Vote Mama and download the Vote Mama Lobby link. And this is something that we created for, for both electeds to connect with each other, for candidates to connect with each other, but for regular everyday people who want to know how to get involved and what to work on. They can work both on the political side, on the advocacy Seat on the advocacy side and the legislative side, it gives everyday moms the opportunity to get involved. And I actually forgot the new text number, but I'm going to tell you in one second, um, in case you don't want to go to the app store, you can literally just text the word lobby to 41372 and it will send you the link 41372 and it will send you the link join, join that 
and download the app and send it to your friends and get people more involved because this is usually by the time you realize how terrible our policies are, you're a new mom and you're struggling to survive motherhood that you don't know how to go out and fight for systemic change. We're giving you bite-sized pieces of activism that you can do to help change policy, to make that change, even while you're dealing with a million kids and a million things and a crazy schedule. So that is, thank you, Cynthia, just put it in the chat as well. Thank you all so much for that. By the way, you're all my heroes. I'm not a mother yet, but like, I can't even imagine. <laughs> you're all amazing. Um, just as a follow-up question, someone asked, which allies do we have in Congress? So perhaps anyone who you've spoken to who they could potentially like seek to form coalitions with. And then specifically for you, Liuba, um, they wanted to know how they can support your upcoming FEC testimony, if any of us can support it in any way. Uh, so I'll go ahead and turn it over to you guys. Yeah, you can submit testimony. Um, I don't know what the link is right now, but we can send it out to you. We can send it to you so you can share it later. But there, there is um, public testimony that you can submit and respond. Um, it's probably on the FEC website, but I'm not exactly sure what the link is, but we'll get it for you. In terms of allies in Congress, my favorite members of Congress, Katie Porter is incredible. Lauren Underwood is amazing. Um, Jen McClellan just got elected the first black woman to represent Virginia, who's just one of my favorite mamas in Congress. And she just got sworn in yesterday. Abigail Spanberger, Hillary Skolton. Um, we have, there is so Sydney Kamlager just got elected. She was recently elected. Brittany Patterson. There are so many incredible, incredible women in Congress. And there's some really great dads. Um, Eric Swalwell is really wonderful and doing really important work. Um, and I, Ruben Gallego, I, I mean, there's so many wonderful people in office right now. Call them, talk to them, support the legislation that they're working on. I mean, I'd be remiss if I didn't mention, you know, the squad who is really um, holding it down for the progressive end of the caucus. Um, those four women, um, they get a lot of flack for um, you know, pushing the envelope and raising issues. Um, you know, that's AOC, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, Ilhan Omar, Rashida Tlaib, um, and um, who's Ayanna. my new girl? Um, Ayanna Presley. Ayanna Presley, and we also have um, what is her name with the C? She just Corey. Corey Bush. Thank you, Corey Bush. Yes, yes. Um, and so, and also, um, the supposed to be House Speaker Hakeem Jeffries, um, the entire Democratic leadership. Um, you know, we are on at the forefront of the uh, presidential election. A lot of candidates are going to be announcing and launching their campaigns. And so, you know, we have an opportunity to take back the house in two years. And so now's the time to, you know, really ensure that you're paying attention to those votes, um, especially in those districts where um, there are opportunities to flip um, uh, the the state to flip your representative so um pay attention to the votes and you know as we keep saying it takes a woman at least six times to feel confident enough to run so if you are thinking about running if you're on the fence please um take advantage of the resources and and run um i was lucky enough to um my daughter's 23 she'll be 24 this year so as a young mom, I didn't have to, you know, worry about balancing motherhood and childcare and all of the other, but the financial strains that women face on the campaign trail um, are numerous. And so it's important also for organizations like um, Emily's List. Um, and it wasn't until I started running that I found out what the acronym actually meant. And so, um, you know, early money in, and so, um, you know, these organizations need to also ensure they're supporting women as well. All right. And then Brittany, in like 15 seconds, if you could. I'm going to make this super easy because they answered so well. So I'm just going to take everything that they've mentioned and uh, place it in my lap as well. So there you go. <laughs> Thank you so much. And thank you so much to this panel. This has been incredible. Thank you to my colleagues for um, hosting another wonderful day of our Solution Summit. And I'm turning it back over to Katie.
Thank you so much, Lua, Laurieann, Brittany, and Marvelous for your time today, for sharing your time, for sharing your wisdom, your experience. Um, it's truly invaluable. We really, really appreciate it. Um, attendees, I hope you are all feeling as inspired and motivated and uplifted by the energy and hope that was shared today. Um, please visit our website, representwomen.org, for more information on a lot of the things that you have heard today, including take action resources and next steps for how you can be a part of the solution. Um, we would also really appreciate if you could let us know what you think about our Solution Summit. Cynthia just shared a link in the chat for our attendee survey. Um, it should take maybe probably three minutes to complete or less, um, so please weigh in there. And thank you so much again for joining us today. We really look forward to seeing you again tomorrow on the final day of our Democracy Solution Summit, where we will talk about fair representation, focusing on ranked choice voting and the Fair Representation Act, and um, also proportional systems. If that interests you, we will see you there tomorrow. Have a great day, everybody. Bye-bye.